put against everything they've, they've offered. Thank you very much and uh, it's a uh, great pleasure to be here at the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, at Indian Jubilee. Uh, let me spend some time uh, speaking about this uh, project which we have taken on called the Unique Identification Project. Uh, issues and challenges. I'll just sort of explain the background of why this is being done and, uh, and so on and so forth. So basically, I'll briefly explain about what will this UIDI do, what are the challenges today in India that we face on uh, identity, what we think will be the inclusive benefits of uh, having this identity, what are the features of our approach and strategy, what are some of the technology challenges that we will face, and then I'll speak about the risks and finally the goals that we have set for this uh, body. Now, this there has been, as you know, a lot of uh, uh, talk about having some kind of an identity for people, and this is not a new concept. Uh, many countries have done that. The U.S., for example, has a social security number. Many countries have cards, national ID cards, and so on and so forth. And even in India, there's been a lot of debate on this uh, cards and numbers and so on. So basically what we plan to do is create a body which will issue a number for everyone. In other words, the idea is that every, every Indian resident should have a number. Uh, the body that we have will not be in the card activity. It's not going to issue cards. It's going to issue numbers because we think the number is really the important thing. The card is nothing but a, a token or embodiment of the number and therefore it's really about getting the number right. Uh, the challenge we have, and the reason we are, we are doing this is that, uh, uh, there are a number of reasons. First is that we don't really have a, a number for every person like many other countries have. Second thing that is happening is that more and more of India's uh, social welfare programs are being directed to a direct individual beneficiary. For example, uh, if you are an NREGA worker, you actually have to go and work and then based on the number of days you work, you will have your wages credited to your bank account and then you go and withdraw the money from your bank account. So in some sense it's directed at an individual, it's not, it's not a, a mass thing, it's meant for people. Or you may have heard of a program called Indira Awas Yojana, which we took the papers today for a lot of uh, diversion of funds. Indira Awas Yojana is a program where homeless, poor women in villages get a certain number of lump sum amount to build a house. Or there is a program called JSY, Janani Suraksha Yojana, which is a program where government gives a cash compensation for uh, pregnant women to come in for antenatal checkups and to come for assisted delivery. And similarly, the PDS, which essentially distributes subsidized rice, wheat, and kerosene, is also meant for the poor and is based on showing that you are on a below poverty line list and that you have a ration card with your family members. So. Thousands of crores of Indian uh, public spending is meant uh, to go to individuals. The catch in all this is that the underlying databases which decide who gets this benefit are not as pristine as you would like them to be. And therefore, in many of our databases, we have a large number of duplicates, we have a large number of ghosts, in other words, people who don't exist, and, and ostensible cards for them. Now, when you have a large number of duplicates and a large number of ghosts, then the quality of your public spending is not of the quality that you want because you may have meant the money or the benefit to go to somebody, but in reality it is going to somebody else. And therefore, from the government point of view, having uh, a way to be much more clear about where the money is going or where the ration is going is very important because as we increase our public spending, as we have the right to food and the right to education and all these things, it's very important that we are very, very optimal enough in, in the way the public expenditure happens. Now that's the from the point of view of the government. From the point of view of the individuals, also it's a big thing. Because many, many Indians are suffering a great deal due to lack of identity. Uh, it's all right for the people sitting in this room because they have education, they have a credit card, they have a bank account, many of them have a passport, they have a driver's license. So people like us don't really have a challenge with identity. But there are a vast number of people running into hundreds of millions of people in this country who have absolutely no form of identity. They have no means to really verify who they are. 
And this often happens because uh, they often don't have birth certificates, so there's no way to prove when they were born. Uh, they don't have education, so they don't have degree certificates or school certificates. Uh, they are often homeless. There are 75 million homeless in this country. So people like that who are living on the margin of a society don't have any form of identity. And therefore, identity and the lack of identity has become a form of divide. In other words, there are people who have identity and people who don't. And if you're going to talk about stuff like inclusive growth, inclusive growth is not just an abstract phenomenon, it's about actually individuals having access to opportunity. And therefore, access to opportunity is linked to having an identity. In other words, having an identity and having an acknowledged existence by the state is, is the first step to getting all the other things that you deserve to get. And that has, in some sense, been the, one of the challenges that we have. But as I explained to you, the existing databases have large number of duplicates and large number of uh, ghosts. And therefore, our challenge becomes, how do we create a system which is robust, which has integrity, which ensures that a person has only one number and that person is unique? That's really the challenge that we have. Now, how do we propose to do that? We propose to do that by using a science or technology called biometrics. So biometrics is something which has been around for many, many years, but in the last 20, 30 years with the advances in computing, we have a lot of computer-based solutions for biometrics. Biometrics can be any physiological or biological attribute which we can use to, to identify a person uniquely. It could be your fingerprints, it could be uh, the, your uh, iris, retina kind of thing, it could be your face, it could be a DNA sample, you know, it could, it could be anything. There are many, many things that can be used uh, for, uh, for biometrics and uh, we are in the process of deciding what is that biometric set which we will use in our uh, thing for uniqueness and uh, we believe it's going to be a combination of uh, all 10 fingers. In other words, we'll take the fingerprints of all the 10 fingers, it will be a picture of the person and possibly it will have an uh, iris uh, scan that is still being debated. We have set up a biometrics committee to decide the final shape of that, that data set. Now, using the biometrics, we believe we will be able to ensure uniqueness. In other words, with the right set of biometrics, every individual will have a unique identifier or a unique signature, a biometric signature, which makes him or her different from everybody else. So one part of the problem that we hope to solve is to make sure by using the science of biometrics, we have uniqueness. But uniqueness by itself does not solve the problem because you also want to make sure that there are no duplicates. In other words, that there are that a person does not have a number twice in the system. Now, that's a much more complex job because how do you make sure that a person does not have a number more than once? The only way you can really make sure of that is by taking each person in your system and then comparing that person's biometric signature with all the other people in the system. So if you are just a file, you take the first record, compare it with everything else, then the n minus one, n minus two, that kind of thing. So it's, you know, you can go to this huge loop of, uh, of, uh, of iterations to remove du duplicates. Our view was that if we design the system uh, to capture duplicates at the point of entry, then we can make sure that rather than later on after you know, going and trying to scrub the data to find out the duplicates, we thought it's better that the duplicates be captured at the point of entry, which means when a new person is enrolled in this database, then we'd like to check whether the person already exists in the database under some other name. So what happens is that, so let's say the database has 100 million records, let's say it has 400 million people in it. In other words, it has records for uh, 400 million people and one evening a million new people come saying we want a number from you and these million people give some name and address and so on and so forth. What we will do is as part of that day's end of day process we will take each of the million records and we will compare with the existing 400 million in the database to see whether in fact that person already exists in the database with some other combination of uh, name and address and date of birth. And if we find a biometric match between the new record which we have got and any one of the existing 400 million records in the system, 
then we will reject that on the grounds that it is a duplicate. Now the duplicate may be for two reasons. One, it may be a simple oversight by the person that they, they don't know the system works at the back end or it could be a malicious attempt to get a duplicate number. And then we know that and we will have to have a process for that. But fundamentally, we will go through this process which is called inelegantly as deduplication to make sure that everybody has a unique number. So, we have talked about having this uh, database. The database will be one large central database. So, when this tank is filled, it will have 1.2 billion or whatever is India's population at the time. And apart from the biometrics, it will have a set of fields which are called variously as demographic fields or, or de uh, biographic fields. And what are those fields? Those fields are actually very simple. You will have the name, we will have the number of calls, we will have the date of birth, we will have the sex, we will have the father's name, the mother's name, the current address and the permanent address. So it's a very simple set of information about the individual. Essentially, it's, it's almost tantamount to what you would have in a, in, a, in a passport kind of a document. Now, it's very important to realize that we are limiting the number of fields in this database only for the purpose of verification. In other words, this is not some kind of a master database that will have everything under the sun. It's only limited to information that is required for verification. This database does not have any profiling attributes. It does not talk about his income level or his religion or, or caste or anything else. It's simply about a person, his name, his address and so forth. This database will also not have transaction records. In other words, this is just one big master database of a billion names. There's no transactions in this system. And every person who has a record in the system will be given a unique number, which will be randomly generated. Now, one of the challenges we face, and this is a challenge faced in, in countries like ours, is that how do you verify the person is the person when you enroll the person? Now, the first time when somebody gets in, how do you make sure? Now, we can make this verification process very, very tight. We can say, show us this document, show us that document, show us your birth certificate, go and show our address. But if we had to really apply a very rigorous form of verification, many of our people would not get a number. Because they would not be able to substantiate that number, to substantiate their, their identity with documents. And especially the poor will have a bigger challenge. Now the purpose of this system is inclusion. Is to give the poor and the marginal a chance to participate in society. Therefore, given that that is our purpose, it's important that we are considerate and sensitive to the fact that the poor will not, or the poor or the marginal people will not have the level of documentation that you would require, say, to get a passport. And therefore, we will have a simple verification uh, based on a few criteria which will allow a person to get a number because giving the number is an inclusive process and therefore we have to be sensitive to the fact that many people will not have the kind of documentation that is required for a more stringent thing. Now, if we are going to apply this more considerate bar to give a number to everybody, what happens? How is this data going to be used by other people? For example, if I if I if I do this simple check and give a number, the passport guy may say, you know what, you know that that level of verification is fine because you wanted to give this, this person a number, but for my system, because my job is to issue passports, and I want to make sure that the passport person getting a passport has a certain uh, nationality, or I want to make sure the drug. Yeah, the person getting a passport does not have a criminal record. You know, your, your basis for giving the number is not enough for me. And I need to do something more. And that more will vary from organization to organization. For the passport people, it may be checking the police verification. For the ration card, it may be checking the income level, and so on and so forth. And therefore, we are providing the ability where we are saying, you know, you use our number in our database for basic verification. But for any add-on verification, you do it as part of your business process. And our basic verification, we call that as know your resident. Now, it's like know your customer, except we call it as know your resident. And that additional verification that you do 
for the purpose of your application. We call that as Know Your Resident Plus or KYR Plus. And that's how we're able to solve the conundrum between the verification needs of the poor and the verification needs of different applications. So fundamentally, we'll issue these numbers. So if everything goes well, there'll be a day in the future where we'll have a tank of names, one record per person, unique number, some biometric information, some bank of information, no duplicate. So what do we do with this stuff? The system will provide the ability for online ID authentication. This is a very important concept. It's not just a database that's lying out there. This database can be used for the purpose of ID authentication. What is, why, why is ID authentication a big deal? It's a big deal because there are a whole variety of applications where you want to verify that the person who is in front of you is the person who should be getting this thing. For example, you want to uh, allocate, suppose uh, somebody's entitled to uh, you know, a ration, of cheaper rice, cheaper kerosene, cheaper wheat. You want to make sure that if the person comes, that he in fact is the person who is eligible to get that and that you record that he has received his share of, of uh, subsidized grain. Or if a person comes to a, a business correspondent of a bank, you want to make sure that he is the person he claims to be before you allow him to withdraw his money and so on and so forth. So there are a whole variety of applications or situations where we need to be able to verify the identity of a person. Now, we can't do that today easily because we have no ID and then, you know, all this paperwork and go and get this document, all this stuff. What we propose is online identification. Now, how does this work? So, let's say that a person comes to a Kirana store to operate a bank account. He wants to withdraw 500 rupees from his bank account and the Kirana store is a business correspondent. Then he will come and he will put his thumb or any other finger on a fingerprint reader and the system will make an online connection to our database, check that this combination of name, number and fingerprint is there on the system and send a message back hopefully in 5 seconds saying that yes, he is the person he claims to be. On the other hand, if there is no match, we will say no, he is not the person he claims to be. And this online authentication, we think, is a very important feature because it provides the foundational infrastructure for a whole variety of applications that can be done in any field. For example, that lady who goes for her uh, uh, antenatal checkup, she can do an online verification and then we can open the record on the cloud which has got her you know, health uh, parameters and then you can do the appropriate thing, key it in and update it on the cloud. Or, or you know, there's so many. I mean, and if the, you know, our imagination runs amok in terms of how this can be used. So the important thing is that this this online authentication is a platform. It's a horizontal open access platform, which can be embedded in any business process, any application to be used for other things. Now the only thing, only answer this system gives you is yes or no. In other words, if he says, I am Mr. X number 123, and he puts his finger, we'll check and say, yes, the person is the person he claims to be, or he is not. In other words, you cannot read data on this system. If you can't go and say, hey, give me this guy's address, or give me his birth date. You can't do all this privacy invasion stuff. All you can do is confirm yes or no, that X is X. And it's a one-to-one -one check. It's, you, know, you give a name number, you confirm it. And therefore, the only details a person can see is about himself. Because obviously, you, your data is your own. And you want to make sure that your data is up to date. So you can open your own record and check whether your address and name and all is correct. So this online authentication is very important. Now, how does this online authentication work? This online authentication can work on any wireline or wireless connection. In other words, it can work even over a cell phone. And what you need to make it work is a cell phone and a fingerprint reader. And this cell phone fingerprint reader combination can be assembled for maybe 5,000 rupees. And therefore, you can create an authentication point 
out of off the shelf technology using say a, a cell phone and a fingerprint reader which anyone can use for authentication and there can be any number of users of this so this is the open architecture that we have which is a very strategic part of our design now verifying id is a common challenge across all our services whether it is getting an NRG job card, whether it's getting a ration card, whether it is opening a bank account, whether it is getting an LPG connection, whether it is getting school admission, everything links to ID. And today ID is, as I said, many people don't have ID and it is also a thriving market for fake ID. So even the whole thing is, is riddled with challenges. So the purpose of the UI DAI is only to do ID verification. That's all we will do. We'll have this tank of names. It will be unique numbers, biometrically unique, and you can do online ID verification. Having a number in this system does not confer any rights on the individual. It does not give you any entitlements. It does not give you any benefit. It does not give you any privileges. It does not give you any nationality. It does not give you any citizenship. It just says X is X. That's all. Because we are not, if, 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 if the ration card department wants to give somebody a ration, then they will check whether he's eligible for that. If the passport department wants to give a passport, they will check whether he's eligible for that. If the if somebody else wants to give some other benefit, they will check. That's the that's the application of business rules to be done by by the relevant department. All that will confirm to you is the person is the person he claims to be, he or she claims to be. Now who gets this number? All residents will get this number. In other words, any resident Indian who is able to demonstrate their name, their number and their address will be able to get this number. Infants will also get this number. The reason why we have to give infants and students this number is if you want to, for example, if you want to improve your immunization ratios, you want to have full immunization, then you need to have a calendar, you need to track it, you need to make sure He's gone for his polio or this, all these, all these uh, polio, all these vaccinations. Today, a large part of the challenge of vaccination in India is simply we don't track the child. Or the child spends the first few months in the place where a mother went for the delivery and then she goes to some other town. All the records are local, so the records all get mixed up, you know, it, you know, you know all the issues. So tracking is one of the big reasons for, you know, underperformance in immunization. So for that, you, if you have a UID for the infant, and then you can create, you know, sort of an online tracking kind of thing. Then you can improve your immunization rates. Students also need this number because you can look at admission, and attendance, and so on and so forth. So basically, we will give all these people a number. However, the challenge we have is up to a certain age of maturity, whether it's 16 or 18, the biometrics are often unformed, and therefore we cannot rely on the biometrics alone. And therefore, what we plan to do is, along with the infant or student's number, we will have the mother or guardian's UID number so that we have a way to sort of link the whole thing together. Now, apart from that, oh yeah. uh, apart from that, this number is voluntary. We are not insisting that you have this number. We are just a utility that provides this number on a unique basis. However, somebody who takes this number may decide to make it unique in their space or make it mandatory in their space. For example, the income tax people may say, all new people getting a PAN card must have a UID number. And after a few years, they'll say that unless you have a UID enabled PAN card, you can't have a PAN card. No, they'll make it mandatory in their zone of influence. And over time, hopefully more and more systems will need this number and therefore the number, though it is not mandatory from our side, will become ubiquitous because there will be some application or other that you want to do. So there is opening a bank account or you know, buying an insurance policy or getting a driver's license or getting a passport or buying a stock transaction or whatever you want to do. So that will essentially make this number ubiquitous because more and more applications will want this number. Now, we think this is a very inclusive idea because it gives you the power of identity. As I said, there are lots of people in this country who don't have identity and once you have identity, it gives them access to opportunity. It allows them 
enhanced access to public services. It's a way to give direct benefits to the poor, because now you have the number, you can make sure the right person gets the benefit. A person who is dead can't claim the benefit, because they can't come with this biometric. So it essentially improves that whole thing. We also will have a special program to reach out to marginalized groups, because if we just do enrollment, they may miss out a lot of people. So we'll have a program to cover both geographically difficult areas as well as groups of people who often find it difficult to get ID. I mean, I have heard of cases of people who have migrated to this city 10 years back who still don't have any ID in the city. They're just on the margin. Really, we can't have all that happening, and therefore we'll reach out to all the people. We also believe that having the UID will ease the mobility because you have the number that you can go anywhere and verify your identity. Now, how does this work? We, we, I talked to you about authentication. I talked to you about a tank full of names. How do we fill this tank? Uh, in other words, how do we get 1.2 billion people inside this tank? That's the challenge. Now, the way we will do that is through an ecosystem of partners. In other words, we are not going to go out there and enumerate everybody or enroll everybody. The enrollment will happen through our partners whom we call as registrars. Who are these registrars? A registrar can be a state government, a registrar can be an insurance company, it can be a bank, it can be an oil ministry. Because each of these agencies actually has some services or products that they touch the citizen or resident every day. For example, millions of people come every day to the bank to, to do a transaction. Or, or uh, somebody comes to a state panchayat for, uh, for, for getting the NRG job, or somebody else comes to the food and civil supplies department ration shop to get some ration. So across all these agencies, you have multiple enrollment points. And it is the enrollment will happen through these channels. In other words, if somebody goes to one of these agencies and does not have a UID number, then that agency will enroll on our behalf. So they are essentially, you can think of them as client acquisition channels that collect numbers on our behalf. And that's the way we'll be able to ramp this up because we'll have many, many partners all contributing numbers to us. And we will help them in doing this and, uh, and, and make sure they have a justification for doing so. Now we believe that the people will want this number, especially the people on the margin. Because this number will act as a key, as a door that opens other doors for them. Give them a chance to participate better in society. Because if they enroll only once, they have the ID for life. Today, if they go to seven different locations, for each of them they have to go through verification over and over again. Each of them is fraught with harassment and so on and so forth. But in our model, if you enroll only once, you use the ID for life. We think this makes it a very attractive thing for the people. Also, this means that overall transaction cost in the system will come down. Because verification costs across the ecosystem, across the society will come down. So the productivity will go up because transaction costs will come down. The other important thing is we believe that this system will be self-cleaning. What do we mean by self-cleaning? Today, many of our systems allow people to have duplicates because they don't have a robust enough way of ensuring there are no duplicates. Once a system has allowed duplicates and once an individual has a desire to take more than his share of the benefit, then he can create multiple duplicates about himself. And the way he would do that is by altering a few details. So, Madan Lal Rao will become Madan Lal Rao in First time, ML Rao, second time, MR Lal, third time, LR Madan, fourth time, and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of intellectual horsepower to do all these things. And there's a lady in Gujarat, famous case, who had 10,000 bank cards. Don't ask me how she got an extraordinary brilliant woman who could get 10,000 bank cards. And we have heard this over and over again, you know, we have heard this story of this one of the municipalities that has 15,000 ghost employees. You know, all this stuff is happening. Now, in our view, when you allow 
uh, when you allow duplicates, then the incentive structure is to game the system. You will create more and more record about yourself using all the combination. Similarly, people have gaming on their age. If a person is 50 years old and is in government service, he will claim to be 40 years old. So he gets another 10 years of service in government. On the other hand, when that same person goes to get an old age pension, he suddenly becomes 60 years old. <laughs> so 60 is the age at which you get pension. So all this you know, dynamic identity stuff is happening. On a third case, you have a village of 10,000 people, of whom 3,000 are fishermen and 2,000 are weavers. So when we have a weaver benefit program, all 10,000 become fishermen, uh, weavers. <laughs> when you have a fisherman benefit program, all 10,000 miraculously become fishermen. So this is how you know systems work today. In our view, because in this system there is only one record per person, the incentive is to keep your data clean. Because if the data is bad, then everyone is using this bad data. Okay, if you are 40, you can claim to be 50, but then you are stuck with 50 or whatever. You, know, you can't keep changing it. So we think this is a self-cleaning system and everybody will finally realize that having their data clean in this is very important. And that's an important distinction between today's system because of the fact there is only one record per person. So fundamentally we think people will have an incentive to have a number in the system. Same time, why will all these registrars come and partner with us? Why will a state government come and partner? Why will, why will uh, uh, you know, State Bank of India come and partner? Why will LIC come and partner? They will come because they also have a certain benefit of being part of our system. First, it will help them to reduce leakages. As I explained, there is a lot of leakage happening in our public service. Second, it reduces the verification cost. Because somebody comes to them with a UID, then they will, you know, their, their whole verification becomes much simpler. Third, it will, for those social programs, it will enable them to get inclusive reach. It will, if, if we make sure that everybody has a UID and the, the really poor have a UID, then those social programs that are meant to reach the poor can reach them more easily. And finally, for those people who are in the revenue business, UIDs will help in increasing revenues because you will essentially have UIDs in bank accounts, so you will have less account, unrecorded money, all those kind of things. In other words, the architecture of this, the incentive of this is a design where people will have an incentive to have the number and all these registrars have an incentive to become a partner so that they issue numbers on our behalf and hopefully because all the incentives are aligned, we will be able to create this ecosystem where we will be able to issue numbers in large numbers. Now you may ask, you know, you have all these different registrars, state governments, banks, all this, how will you make sure your data is clean? And the way we do that is by having a standard uniform enrollment process. Every registrar, whether he is registering an NRGA worker in Bihar or some upmarket guy in Kapparin opening a bank branch at ICICI Bank, they will have to follow the same enrollment process. The same fields, the same verification. So the data coming into our system will be, you know, cleaned at, at the point of entry. And the number is not issued at the point of entry. At the point of entry, if the person already has a number, then they will give the bank account or whatever. If the person doesn't have a number, then the file is sent to us at the back. And then we'll do that thing I mentioned to you, the deduplication process. So you can think of this as distributed enrollment, centralized issuance of numbers. That's the only way you can do this. And every night across the country we will get from all our registrars files with these numbers and then we'll do this deduplication. If the person is a duplicate, we'll send it back saying, pal, this, this person is already here the number. If the person is not a duplicate, we'll issue a number to them. And that's the basic logic that we'll have. And all this will be very robust uh, software. We'll actually give the software to our partners. So they can't use their own software. They have to use our software for enrollment. And then you can have multiple authentication. For example, somebody may say, I want to do local authentication on a smart card. In which case, he will capture the fingerprints for his application and then do a local check. For example, there's an insurance program called RSBY which does that. But our preferred model is online authentication on our server where if somebody comes, puts his finger, will validate in five seconds and tell him the person is a person. So we believe that this will have a huge impact on, uh, on uh, pro poor delivery system because the challenge in our public governance is the last mile. You know, so we are all, all ultimately whether it's delivering healthcare, delivering education, delivering banking services, 
Everything is boiling down to the last mile. How does it, at the point of contact of that Indian resident, how does it work? And we think these are all tools that will help. To, now, just having UID is not going to solve the problem. You still have to re-engineer your applications and your public service delivery to use the power of UID. And that will take a long time. It's not some miracle cure which is going to you know, fix everything in a day. But once more and more people have the number, and once people realize the power of verification authentication, then they will redesign that system. If there's an RDGA system, PDS system, whatever, and they will use this number for, for, for speedening up or improving transparency or customer service or convenience or whatever it is. Now, what are some of the technology challenges we have? Now, one is nobody's done this stuff before. It's a small problem. But nobody's done this stuff before. The largest biometric database may be 120 million or so. We are talking about a database that is 10 times as large, 1.2 billion. So that scale itself causes new challenges. And uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, no one finger, like only fingerprints may not be enough. Fingerprints plus photo plus iris, you know, we have to figure out all that. Because remember, you have to make sure that you have a biometric set which gives uniqueness across a billion people. Similarly, we'll have a lot of people who will not have the biometrics form because we want to give a number not just to adults but also to children. We have to have a way to deal with that. We need to look at the enrollment scale. 1.2 billion people across the country have to be enrolled. So you'll need the right equipment, mobile equipment, going there, how do they cap it and finger, all this stuff. You have to design it very, very simply because if you add one keystroke, that's 1.2 billion keystrokes that you have to do to get that thing in. Right? You add one field, there's 1.2 billion fields you have to capture. So you have to be very, very minimalistic in your design and make sure that you keep it absolutely down to the leanest requirements to make verification work. But the other challenge we have is, while fingerprints is acceptable in many parts of India and in, in, in the world where you have rough manual labor, the fingerprints often get, you know, they get erased. Uh, people who chew pan and do this stuff, or people who climb arekana trees, and all of them have challenges with these fingerprints. So how do we do, deal with the problem of fingerprints? And we can use the uh, the iris technology, which is a uh, you know capture of uh, of the eye. But again, you know the issue about costs and this and that. And then how do we ensure quality? If you're going to have thousands of enrollment points in villages, in mountains. You know, uh, in the coastal, the urban areas, different kind of issues. How to make sure each and every one of them follows the same approach, same process excellence, same quality, this, that, compliance, audit, inspection, all that stuff. So massive challenges. And deduplication. So if you assume there are 10 fingerprints per person, if you have 800 million people in the database, you have 8 billion fingerprints to scan. Right? Because if you check every, you don't know which finger it is, you have to check all, all the fingers. So this is a massive computational challenge which, which has to be done and as I said, nobody has done it, we are hoping it will work. So the huge architecture issues, you know, how, how you, you have to use massive uh, distributed computing, you know, blade servers, thousands of servers, you know, it, 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 all using cloud computing, that is a lot of virtualization. All these searches will have to be in memory, so you have to bring the whole table into memory and then do the search. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's really very difficult stuff and it optimized for computation. For example, if, if the uh, authentication happens, then literally millions of people will be doing online authentication with a less than five second response requirement. So the, that will be the SLA. So it'll have to be you know, again multiple parallel processing and authentication and so forth. So basically, there's a lot of challenges. Not, and also, this is not a transaction system. You know, we think of these systems as OLTP system. This is not an OLTP system because you're not updating like bank balances. This is a system where you write once and read one, you know, words kind of thing. You write once, read many times. And therefore, the whole architecture can't be used with traditional databases. You have to think differently for these kind of applications. Then the whole connectivity issue. How do we make sure this stuff works? Because assuming authentication works on a mobile, how do we make sure that you can get five second response on the mobile? Now, a, a, a fingerprint is one MB. You can't be sending 1 MB files up and down some you know, cell phone network. Therefore, we have to find a way of compression, we have to find a way of capturing the minutiae, reducing the file to a few bytes and sending it. All that stuff has to be done on the, on the device. And then 
environment is done offline, so how do we make sure we collect the batch enough? So there are lots and lots and lots of issues here which make this more very, very technologically complicated. And technology is only one part of a very large problem. Then there's the whole issue of security, how do we make sure fraud detection, encryption, PKI. You know, this will create a whole industry of hackers who will want to get into the database. Now all these guys in IIC, you know, in the spare time may be doing this. But the whole you know, massive challenge. You know, this itself will be the biggest problem, right? How do you break into this database? So all that stuff, you have to make sure it's, it's bulletproof. So fundamentally, it's a very, very complex project because there are multiple risks. I have spoken briefly on the technology risk, but there's a scale risk because nobody else has done this scale, everything else is one tenth of our scale. There's an enrollment risk, how do we get 1.2 billion people with the right quality? There's an adoption risk, even if you do this, how do we make sure applications use this stuff? Then there's the whole privacy and security issue. They'll say, oh, this, they're sitting on this database, 1.2 billion people, you know, George Orwell is back in town, you know, the whole surveillance, privacy kind of thing. So how do we make sure that we technologically, legally and societally make sure this database is not abused? Then there's going to be political risk because you know this is going to have its challenges politically. So this is a very complex uh, project, but you know we're doing it anyway. So wish us luck and we hope to do it. Now what is our goal? Our goal is that we will uh, uh, essentially our goal is to issue the first UIDs in 12 to 18 months. In 12 to 18 months, clock started ticking uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, August 12th. So we have made a commitment. The finance minister has committed in parliament that this will happen. So we are making it happen. And after that, it'll, it, we hope to ramp it up. And we hope to basically get about 600 million people into the system four years from that date, which is about five and a half year, years from now. We hope to get more than half a billion system in this uh, thing and then co complete coverage we think will take more time because you have to go to every nook and corner of this country and people who have never had ID will have to be an ID. And uh, Dr. Balram says he doesn't want a number, so I have to see how to convince him to get one number. <laughs> so this is the plan, this, we think that this is fundamentally, uh, if you can pull it off, it's, it's quite transformational, but there's a long haul, so we're still very early days, all that we have is a laptop and PowerPoint, but we hope to get there one day. Thank you very much. Well, they will get a letter from us. You can bring the letter, they can keep it with them, they can store it on their mobile phone, they can tattoo it on the skin. I mean, <laughs> 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 The amount of documentation which they will provide is almost the same as somebody who is an Indian citizen who does not have anything. So how do you address this problem? We will give the number to all Indian residents who meet our verification standards. This number is not a proof of citizenship or nationality. Yeah. We don't make that assertion. We are only giving a number to everybody. Okay, the same problem and nothing exists again. Suppose what? I want to give something to poor people. I cannot identify who is poor. So somebody else will come and take that. No, no, no. It is. There, there are institutions and departments of government whose responsibility is to ascertain uh, whether somebody is poor and make the appropriate... Uh, and then make a list of... Uh, yeah, this was I do today. How is the BPL this done? But what will happen is... Again, today, the same problem will exist. No, it's not exist. I mean, it exists in sense, you can still give rich people, poor people. Uh, right? And not an ecology problem. And not an ecology problem. Okay. It's a social problem. But today, for example, in many states, the number of ration cards is more than the population of the state. <laughs> <laughs> that is useful for me. You don't have a number. You don't have a number. <laughs> then you'll, you'll, you'll go to uh, get a passport. You'll not get a passport. Because they are UID. You want to buy a share, you will not get a, you will open a, you can't open a bank account. 
You can't get a ration card. So no later, either you'll have to hibernate or you'll have to get a number. <laughs> and if you get a number and you have malicious intent, and if the system suspects that the person is having a malicious intent, then under the appropriate law, just like today you can wiretap a suspect, you'll be able to track the person. And the other part of your question was the cost. See, the cost is definitely not what you said. The cost is, in our view, an order of magnitude lower than that. And uh, I don't know what the exact cost is, simply because we haven't done the uh, specs, you know, for example, whether you use IRIS or don't use IRIS has an impact on cost. So we don't know the exact cost. But look at this way. We are spending every year a few hundred thousand crores on social programs, right? NREGA, 40,000 crores. In 2007, a fertilizer subsidy alone was 100,000 crores. A, a PDA subsidy runs into 7,000 crores. And we know that it's not necessarily reaching the right people. You see, you see in a particle. So if this, on one side, even if it can bring in a small fractional improvement in the quality of the public expenditure, it's well worth it because this is a one-time expense for a solution for perpetuity. Look at that. And secondly, look at the social benefit. There are a few hundred million people in this country who don't have identity. Don't you think they deserve a chance like everybody else? So I think the social benefits as well as the efficiency benefits make it very worth it. Yeah. Uh, how are you going to make sure that the registrars are going to be honest and they're not going to be randomly generating any biometrics? <laughs> So there is a need for public discussion on this particular, especially the familiarity of UID. A lot of people don't know about UID. And also in a pilot study to be made before it is uh, implemented. Uh, what, what is the first point? Public awareness about UID, sir. People don't know about UID now. Except the people like my people in Bangalore and other places. There is well, no awareness. Know about UID. <laughs> no, no, I mean it is still early days yet. We are, you know, it's only three months since we started. We will have a communication uh, initiative at the right time. because. We are still 12 to 18 months away from giving these numbers, so we can't be premature about that. But, but let me tell you, in terms of public consultation and all that, I don't know anyone else who has been as we have, we have met with every government department, we have met the public, we have had meetings like this in every city, we have gone to many, already 11 states. So we are trying to 
uh, once our website is up, all this will be on our website. So we will make it very, uh, very transparent in the way it works. What is the lifetime of the database and will it stay good for decades? Or do you have multiple copies of them? We'll make sure that the system really, I'm putting a technology question here. Assuming that the sort of thing what is... Mean, what is making multiple copies, what to do with like? No, what do you mean is that, uh, do you have many records so that if one thing system crashes, you'll be able yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, we'll have replication, we'll have backup, we'll have option, option backup, all that. I mean, that's all basic, we have to do that. So, the database is good for 100 years, I mean? No, the database <laughs> is a database which has a record on every individual. Obviously, after 50 years, there will be records and also of people who are dead. But there will also be records hopefully of everybody who is alive. So the database will, will be there in perpetuity. Sir, this matrix appears to be a non-significant state sequence and numbering system. Uh, what, what? This is a non-significant in the sense, this will not identify a person as a man or a woman. There are certain characteristics I am trying to say. This system will not reveal. For instance, suppose one, uh, there are 16 uh, uh, digits are there. In one of the digits, if we say one, if it is man, if it is two, it is a woman. Like that, if it is identified, it becomes a significant number. So that from looking at the number, one can say about a person characteristics and things like that. Is it possible? A lot of people and for all computer science gurus in this audience, but the general belief now in database design is that you don't embed intelligence in the number. So men and this thing need not be identified as such. No, number number should not have intelligence because it leads to both fraud and privacy considerations. For example, in the Sweden, in Sweden your date of birth is like a number. If I know your number, I know your date of birth. That's not a good thing to know, right? Hey, there's a privacy issue here. So the current thinking about numbering is that the number itself should not have any intelligence. It should be a random number. The so number you not have this. The <coughs> number does it include a self check the digit set to yeah. see whether trans transcription error. Yeah. There will be a check sum on it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sir, the number is useful for the service provider because it eliminates uh, duplicates. But from the point of view of individual, he has only double the problem. He has not only get the unique number, in addition, he has to get specific uh, numbers for specific services. Yeah. It doesn't eliminate any specific service. So what is the uh, help you are giving to the poor and uh, less educated people? The other person, you are, are fine, you are fine, you are fine. Yeah, we have your passport or all that. But the poor don't have any number, for them it's very important. No, no. Getting number is not empty itself, but how does it help him? I mean, he will not have access to any service. No, Say for health service, he cannot simply go to the number and get health service. He still has to get a separate yeah. card. Yeah, yeah. 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 but, but. The ID verification, which is a significant part of the challenge of getting any service, is now taken out. So let's say that the effort to get a service is 100, or let's say 10, then let's say the verification will knock out 3, 4, 5. That itself is a big thing for it because he does have to keep verifying himself. Now, whether we can, the thing is we, we are looking at how to say, are there any services which are automatically available to you if you have a UID. That's yes. another conversation. That would be very useful. Yeah, but you know, that's a negotiation we have to do. You know how government works? <laughs> secondly, secondly, recently, uh, secondly, uh, the data you collect uh, will it be quite uh, elaborate. I mean, can it have uh, something more like with the census? Census work, uh, can we eliminate the duplication of work in collecting enormous census data? No, no. See, the census has a particular purpose which has been around for many years. We are collecting a very small subset of the data that the census collects. But the subset of the data that the census collects, which is relevant to us, will be made matching with us. So that we'll make sure that, that, that we can reuse that. And when they collect biometrics, they will collect with us. But we can't go around collecting lots of data because you, this is about verification. We're not asking anything else. We just want to verify the guy is the guy. Or the woman is the woman. That's it. Very simple. Minimalistic. Recently, we introduced a biometric access control system. Where is this? Where is this? It works fine for most of the other, all the other people who are much younger than me. But I have a tough time. <laughs> now I am I am told it is because my fingerprints are very faint. 
Now, I am worried if you introduce your UID, I may not even be able to operate my bank account. <laughs> How many in your India biometric system, how many fingers? You have only one finger with you? We have all ten, so if one of your ten fingers. <laughs> on, the, yes, on the issue of scale, it doesn't seem to be very dissimilar to the social security. It's not online. There's no biometric. There's no real-time authentication. See, authentication is only one finger for authentication. If, it, if the first finger doesn't work, it has the second finger. If that doesn't work, it has the third finger. Some finger will work. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, if any government service wants to use your ID as authentication, uh, how will they make sure of uh, uh, that X is X at each and every time of entry? I mean, at each and every time of check. You were uh, mentioning about that you won't give any information, just you will say that S or no. Yeah. So how can they make sure that X is X? No, no, no. Let's say that, first of all, you know, it's the application design that you choose to do. I mean, let's say you're operating the PDS system. It's not necessary that everyone you need to authenticate. You can say, I'll do random authentication. If you feel that you'll check 5 out of 100 because... Uh, uh, all others, they give you the number and you can take it as a case. That's a design issue. So what will happen is, the, in those 5%, let's say we are doing this random authentication, the person comes and says, I'm Mr. X, my number is 123. And you decide to say, is it really Mr. X, 123? Then you ask him to put the speaker. If one finger doesn't work, it has the other finger, either it's good time. And that will go and make an online request to our database and confirm that Mr. X is 123 and this finger is back. It will say yes. Once we confirm that, then that application will unlock whatever entitlement he's entitled to get. That's a feature of the business rules of the application that's running there. We are only giving a simple service which allows it to authenticate. The last question. When an agency utilizes your UID and it collects some information as you said, registrars, does the treatment get updated in your UID so that the example which you gave of beavers and fishermen duplicity. That gets automatically eliminated. What, what will happen is a person will have only one number. Right? So let's say that this village offers a, a program for weavers. Then these other guys come and say we weavers and then UID will be there. Now if, if they launch a program for fishermen, then they find that some guys come and give the same UID on the weaver list, you can say, boss, how can you be bored? So that's how we do it. But it doesn't get updated to your database. Our database is, a, is, a, is a, essentially a static database which has uh, enrollment and the only time our database gets changed is when uh, the person has a uh, change of their mask. That means if somebody changes the name, Ajay they can drop the A from the that kind of stuff. Then he has to come and get his name changed. Or somebody gets married, name change. Or somebody has a sex change operation, that change. Or somebody changes the address, that change. So only those kind of changes. You said that there will be a permanent address. Huh? Permanent address also there, yeah. but many of us don't have what is called permanent address. The address keeps changing when you shift There will be a permanent address and a current address. So the current address will keep changing. Maybe you can make your first address your permanent The number from UID is yes. Not from us. But uh, whether giving data is voluntary, you can also withdraw the data. <laughs> appropriate for me to withdraw the data, so will you allow it? Definitely consider the request. <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, a lot of people have to belong to intelligence agencies, raw, this, that, etc. 
How do you develop your intelligence agency unless you have three or four identities? <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Sorry. So I just want your last question. No more. Yes, sir. So I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, you are uh, preparing with all softwares. So, what uh, what are all uh, software programming uh, languages and coding parts?